Hello, I'm Dr. Ann Zychek from the NIH, and I will be speaking today on basic pharmacokinetic concepts. So the topics I am going to cover today, very, very briefly, are the definitions of pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, clearance, volume of distribution, half-life, first-order and zero-order pharmacokinetics, peaks and troughs, and the utility of altering the dosage interval. We will also speak briefly on the concentration effect relationship and a common sense approach to pharmacokinetics. Okay, so let's define our terms. What do pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics mean? Pharmaco comes from the Greek pharmakon, meaning poison or remedy. Pharmacokinetics is what the body does to the drug and is a mathematical description of absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. Pharmacodynamics, on the other hand, is what the drug does to the body. So, uh, movement of drug. So, what we are talking about overall is the drug site of administration. On the left in the blue is oral or PO administration, which undergoes absorption, in some cases first pass metabolism, clearance through the liver, distribution through the body, clearance again through renal and hepatic mechanisms, and elimination. Drug can also be administered intravascularly, where it undergoes distribution, then clearance through renal and hepatic mechanisms, and elimination from the body. What is absorption? Absorption is the movement of drug from the site of administration to the site of action in the vascular space. What routes of administration provide drug from the small intestine to the portal vein and then to the liver for first pass metabolism. Those routes of administration are oral, deep rectal administration, hepatic arterial, and portal venous. And one example would be propranolol. And one thing to note is for drugs that undergo extensive first pass metabolism is there's a large discrepancy between the oral dose and the IV dose. What routes of administration avoid the portal circulation and first pass metabolism? And these include intravenous, intravascular, subcutaneous, sublingual, transdermal, and inhalation pathways. What is distribution? D distribution is the movement of drug from the site of administration or absorption to the rest of the body. The volume of distribution is a proportionality relating the amount of drug in body to the concentration and is not related to a physiologic volume. The range can be somewhere between 0.1 and 7 liters per kilo. Drugs that have a small volume of distribution generally are bound to carrier proteins in blood and are more water soluble. The clinical relevance for this is for a drug which is greater than 90% bound to uh, proteins in the blood, decreased binding, in other words, changes in binding from 90% to 80%, cause large increases in the percent unbound drug and greater clinical effects since the assumption is that the free drug or the unbound drug is the active drug. Drugs with a large volume distribution are generally tissue bound, lipid soluble, and the clinical relevance here is that it's very difficult to remove these drugs by dialysis. What is drug clearance? The volume of blood cleared of drug per unit time, generally um, liters per hour, is the drug clearance. Drug removal from the body is by the kidneys or renal elimination, liver or hepatic and metabolic elimination, and also through breast milk via lactation. What is the half-life? The half-life is the time to clear half of the total body load of the drug or the time for the concentration of a drug to drop by one half. So for example, on the left side, I have a listing of times when uh, blood was drawn and the drug concentration. So at hour two, the concentration was 20. At four, the concentration was 10. At hour six, five. And at eight hours, the concentration was two and a half. It's clear that it has taken two hours for each of those concentrations to drop by half. So in other words, the half-life is two hours. You can plot these concentrations on a semi-log plot with time on the x-axis and log concentration on the y-axis, and that would form a straight line, the slope of the decline, which as a point of trivia, is the elimination rate constant. 
The other value of knowing the half-life is the time it takes to reach steady state. And in this plot, you're seeing a uh, drug being uh, administered by the jagged lines and the gradual increase in drug concentration. And you can see at the bottom of figure one stating that the steady state is reached by 57 and a half hours or five times the 11.5 hour half-life. So in other words, time to achieve steady state, five half-lives. I wanted to mention uh, the concept of first order versus zero order pharmacokinetics. First order kinetics, drugs which exhibit first order kinetics, have a constant percentage of drug eliminated per unit time. In other words, if the drug concentration is 100, at one half life it drops to 50%, and then 25%, 12 and a half, and so on. And the important thing about this is there's a proportionality between the dose and the concentration. So as you double the dose, you double the plasma concentrations. And this is in uh, contrast to zero order pharmacokinetics, where a constant amount of drug is eliminated per unit time. So if you start with 100 milligrams, then the concentration will drop to 90, 80, 70, and so on. And the problem here is that when you double the dose, there's an unpredictable increase in concentration. And three examples of drugs um, or substances, chemicals, that exhibit zero order kinetics are ethanol, phenytoin, and aspirin. And in this case, there's no relevant half-life. Okay, I wanted to talk about some uh, concentration time curves, just so you know what they look like. Um, this is for intravenous. Here we're seeing a plot of concentration against time. At the bottom, you see the time of the infusion, the Tmax, which by definition is the concentration at the end of the infusion. And that concentration going up is the distribution phase. The highest concentration is called the Cmax. The decline is the elimination phase. And the AUC is the area under the concentration time curve. Here is a picture of the concentration time curve for an oral dosage form. This is, again, a plot of concentration against time. And what you're seeing here is that the time of administration is at time zero. As the concentrations go up, absorption is occurring primarily and also distribution. As the concentrations decline, that is the distribution and the clearance phase. And again, we're looking at the Cmax being the highest concentration and the area under the time curve as being an estimate of drug exposure. Now, these are some um, shapes of concentration time curves just to see differences when you see differences in clearance or dif differences in absorption. On the left, you see the IV time curve where there's the uh, rapid increase in concentrations during the time of the infusion and then the drop off during the elimination phase. And on the right are pictures of uh, concentration time curves when the drug is given orally. And the two parameters that uh, people are generally interested in, uh, including the Food and Drug Administration when they make determinations about uh, bioavailability or bioequivalence, are the Cmax and the AUC. So you can see the first curve here is a Cmax area under the curve for one oral dosage form. In the second panel, you can see the Cmax and the AUC. The AUC looks fairly similar to the first one, but you can see that the Cmax is uh, moved to the right, showing delayed oral absorption. So in the third panel, you see a Cmax, which is shifted to the left, a small AUC, which can indicate either poor absorption or rapid clearance. Uh, the next set of curves will describe the, con the concentration response relationship. And here I've plotted on the uh, x-axis the log ibuprofen concentration, and on the y-axis the percent of maximum reduction in headache, which would be the response. And you can see as the area under the curve, the concentrations increase and then drop off, you can see a slight delay, but a uh, relationship between the concentrations of ibuprofen and pain relief. Another way of looking at this would be to plot the pain score against time. And again, you see the ibuprofen area under the curve, 
and then in the decline in headache pain. I think this is a nice way to look at concentration effect relationships. So I'd like to talk about uh, one equation. And this equation is that the steady state concentration of drug is equal to the fraction of drug absorbed times the dose divided by clearance times the dosage interval. And this all makes a lot of sense. So the fraction absorbed can range from zero to one. Um, and if the fraction of absorbed drug changes, that will affect the steady state concentration. For example, if you have a drug, for example, the tetracyclines bind to calcium. So if a patient is taking a tetracycline and then uh, this is administered with yogurt or a calcium containing antacid, that will chelate the tetracycline, decrease the fraction of drug absorbed, you'll have a lower concentration. If the dose of drug is increased or decreased, there will be a proportional change in steady state drug concentration. If the clearance is altered, for example, if you have a drug that's liable to be induced by um, a compound, and that compound that's the drug inducer is co-administered with the drug of interest, and the clearance increases, then the concentration of drug will decrease. And as the dosage interval is spaced out from every four hours to every eight hours and so on, the drug concentrations will also be affected by that change in dosage interval. Okay, I'd like to talk briefly about therapeutic drug monitoring. Therapeutic drug monitoring is used when the drug concentration is closely related to effect. So here is a case. MG is an 87-year-old, 120-pound female admitted two days ago with urosepsis. Labs include a white count of 15,000 with 20% bands, BUN and creatinine of 50 and 1.8 respectively, and a urine gram stain showing gram-negative rods. Okay, so what you can see here is that she's elderly, she's thin, she's probably frail, probably does not have a lot of muscle mass, but her creatinine is 1.8. And that would be fine if she were a 20-year-old bodybuilder, but she is a frail 87-year-old, 120-pound female, so it's likely that she has some renal dysfunction. She started on genomycin 80 milligrams IV Q8 hours. Peak and trough concentrations are drawn today on day two. The half-hour peak is 10 micrograms per mil, target concentration being somewhere between four and 10, and the trough concentration three micrograms per mil, the target being less than two micrograms per mil. And my question to you is, should you A, decrease the dose, B, increase the dosage interval, in other words, give it less frequently, or C, hold the next dose for four hours and restart with the same dose at an increased dosage interval or less frequently? Okay, so just to define our terms, the peak is the highest concentration after the short infusion and it's proportional to the dose. The trough is the lowest concentration or the concentration before the next dose, and it's related to the clearance and the dosage interval, but not the dose. This is a key piece of information. This is commonly misunderstood. So let's plot what's going on here. So our x-axis has the time, and the y-axis has the concentrations. And you can see the first curve, everything looks fine. The concentrations are within bounds. The peak is between, you know, it's less than 10, probably around eight-ish. And the trough is probably around one. But what you can see is that the drug is starting to accumulate because the trough is not going down to zero. And so the peak concentration is equal to the peak from the dose plus the trough from the previous dose. And so what's happening is that at the time that your concentrations are being drawn on that second day, the peak is now higher than 10 and the trough is now higher than two. Okay, so this is your thought process. A high aminoglycoside peak is associated with ototoxicity or hearing damage. A high trough concentration is associated with nephrotoxicity or kidney damage. The peak as it stands right now is on the high end of the desired range and the trough is too high. And our current order, again, is your basic starting dose of genomycin, 80 milligrams every eight hours. Okay, so this is a drawing of the genomycin PK sampling, and I find this to be very helpful to 
plot out exactly what's going on so that you can get a better understanding of what the peaks are, what the troughs are, and what the time interval is. So this is my schematic of what is going on. So let's say that the drug is infused at eight o'clock in the morning, it's usually infused for about 20 minutes. So from eight o'clock to 8.20, the infusion is going on. Blood is drawn at 30 minutes after the infusion, which I'm gonna round off to about nine o'clock. And there, as we know, the peak was 10 micrograms per mil. And then the trough is drawn before the next dose, which is at 1600 hours or 4 p.m., and it's three micrograms per mil. So the time difference between nine o'clock in the morning when the peak was drawn and the trough drawn at 1600 hours is seven hours. Okay, so nine o'clock in the morning, the concentration is 10 and 4 p.m. the concentration is three. So the concentration would have dropped from 10 to five and five to two and a half, about three in seven hours. So that means that two half lives is seven hours, so one half-life is three and a half hours. So that tells you that if you hold the next dose for four more hours, the trough will drop from three micrograms per mil to 1.5 micrograms per mil. And this will also decrease the peak by the same amount. So the new peak will be 10 minus 1.5 or 8.5 micrograms per mil. And this is a plot of what the concentrations are gonna look like. And this is really nice now because Again, after those first three doses, you can see that the peak is coming up, the trough concentrations are coming up. But if you let the concentrations drop off by somewhere around a half-life, or three and a half or four hours, and you change the dosage interval, but not the dose, the dosage interval to every 12 hours, the concentrations will drop off, the peak will drop, and the trough will be down in the range that you're looking for. So our answer to the question, should you decrease the dose, increase the dosage interval, or C, the most correct answer, hold the next dose for four hours and restart the same dose at a less frequent dosage interval or an increased dosage interval to every 12 hours. So in summary, pharmacokinetic principles do not need to be complicated and dose and dosage intervals can be changed to maximize efficacy and reduce toxicity. Thank you very much for your attention.